The history of the African continent is rich and fascinating, but it's also very understudied. The History of Africa podcast is filling a vital niche by covering the diverse civilizations and cultures across Africa. But there are other areas also deserving of greater study, and that's the focus of my show, History Unwritten. Every season, we cover a historical civilization from Africa, Asia, or the pre-Columbian Americas. Our first season covered the Mali Empire in West Africa, and we're close to finishing our second on the medieval Tibetan Empire as well. Each season, we do a deep dive into the political, social, and cultural history of the civilization in question. If that sounds interesting to you, you can find History Unwritten wherever you get your podcasts, or visit the website at historyunwrittenpodcast.com. Anyway, on with the show. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa. I'm your host, Andy. Now, throughout the show, on numerous occasions, I've referenced Oxum's gradual and seemingly unending civilizational rise. Today, we reach the culmination of the centuries of Oxumite history, with the Empire of Oxum reaching its absolute peak in terms of wealth, power, and prestige. If you've ever looked at the cover art of this podcast season on Ethiopia, you've seen the portrait of the man who ruled over this absolute height in Oxumite power. In this episode, we will examine the life and times of St. Caleb, King of Oxum. Episode 20, St. Caleb the Conqueror. Now, if you'll recall a few episodes back, when I first introduced another great Oxumite king, Ezana, you may remember me saying that, if I were to pick one Oxumite ruler to serve as a sort of human encapsulation for Oxumite civilization as a whole, King Ezana would be one of the two likely candidates for this position. The other, of course, is Caleb. Caleb was born around the year 503 AD. Unlike Azana, Caleb's early life is not well documented in the slightest. His father was a man named Tazena, a fairly successful, if unremarkable, king. The details of his father's reign have largely been lost to history, and so the temperament and character of the man have been largely left a mystery. However, one of the few things we do know about him is that he was present for the arrival of the last of the nine saints, and at a young age he sent his son Caleb to receive an education at a Christian monastery. This monastic education would have a profound effect on Caleb for the rest of his life, as it instilled in him a devoted religiosity. Many kings throughout the history of the world are questionable in their devotion to the religion they publicly espouse, proclaiming their faith only as a way to gain influence among the religious establishment. Some of these kings even hypocritically enforce harsh religious doctrines that they themselves flagrantly violate behind closed doors. Sultan Murad IV of the Ottoman Empire, for example, once ordered that the consumption of alcohol should be punished with execution, despite allegedly being a raging alcoholic in his private life. The Frankish king Charlemagne enforced thousands of coerced conversions to Christianity among the Germanic peoples he conquered, but was also married to six women at the same time, against church belief. Caleb, though, probably due in part to his religious education, was not one of these hypocrite kings. Throughout the entirety of his rule, Caleb remained an incredibly devout Christian, both in his public and private life. In fact, the young Caleb didn't really want to be king at all. His dream job was not to rule a country, but was to live as a monk. While life in a monastery may sound bland to modern sensibilities, at the time it was the perfect environment for an inquisitive young mind and a devoted soul like Caleb. Monks were something like the academics of their age, preserving knowledge, examining religious literature, and engaging in theological debates within the limits of church orthodoxy. In a sense, monasteries were the universities of their day, minus the parties and drinking, of course. Basically, Caleb was a big nerd who wanted to read books all day. However, in the year 520, it was made clear that faith had chosen a different path for the young Caleb. King Tazena passed away, and Caleb was made heir to the throne. His only brother, a man named Ariat, was probably actually his half-brother conceived out of wedlock, meaning that there was no alternative choice for king. Caleb, barely even an adult, was forced to mourn not only the death of his father, but was also forced to put his dream of devoting his life to the church on permanent hold. The devastated Caleb was hailed as the new king of Oxum, and immediately saddled with all the responsibilities that came with the position. No longer would he have the time to sit in his room studying old books and contemplating theological theory, as he now had a country to run. And, as if that wasn't bad enough, there couldn't have been a more stressful time for this overwhelmed young man to take the throne. Three years prior to Caleb's ascent to the throne, the kingdom of Himyar across the Red Sea saw its own transition of power. In the year 517, 
a man named Yosef Nuez became king of Himyar. This transition had not been a smooth one. Nuez was not the legitimate heir to the throne, but a pretender who had to kill the previous king to take his spot. Now, to recap a little bit from our last episode, the Himyarite kingdom was in a tough geopolitical spot at this time. About a hundred years prior, the Himyarite king had converted to Judaism in an effort to stay neutral in the rivalry between Christian Rome and Zoroastrian Persia. As a result, Najran, a predominantly Christian city in the western reaches of Himyar, had rebelled against their new Jewish king. Aksum, in an effort to aid their Christian brothers and re-establish influence in Arabia, intervened in the conflict, sending troops to Najran and fighting the Himyarite army to a standstill. In a peace deal struck between this stalemate, Najran remained officially part of the Himyarite realm, but was, in reality, a practically independent city-state protected by a small garrison of Aksumite soldiers. While Aksum had been successful in protecting the autonomy of the Najrani Christians and had established an ally in southern Arabia, they had also permanently spoiled their relationship with Himyar, and ensured that Himyar would drift closer to Persia as a counter to Aksum and their Roman allies. Now, in 518, Najran is still a thorn in the side of the Himyarite kingdom. The city's independence served as a constant reminder of the failure to stop this Najrani rebellion. King Nuas was not exactly a popular ruler among his own people, either. Part of why is obvious. You know, he's a pretender who murdered the previous king. That's going to lead to some people disliking you. But there's also a religious component to his unpopularity. You see, Nuas came from a noble family that had stubbornly stayed pagan, even as most of him are converted to Judaism. Nuaz himself eventually converted to Judaism a little bit before he took the throne, but it's easy to imagine that many Himyarite nobles and rabbis were skeptical of the sincerity of this conversion. I mean, he did convert literally just a few years before his power grab. What are the chances that this was a sincere religious awakening versus a cynical conversion to take the throne? So, if you're in Nuaz's shoes here, you're rightly paranoid. The nobility and rabbi hate your guts. And, not to mention, you literally just overthrew the last king in a coup, so it's likely that someone could do the same to you in the near future. So, Nuaz needed to find something that could improve his standing on the throne, and that thing was Najran. If Yosef Nuaz managed to retake the city somehow, he would not only enjoy the hero status that always comes with winning a war, but he would also prove the sincerity of his conversion by waging a holy war against the Christian Najranis. He ordered the Himyarite army to besiege the isolated city. The small Aksumite garrison in Najran, combined with the valiant efforts of the locals, prevented the Himyarites from overrunning the city's defenses. Najran's supplies ran low. Nuaz took advantage of the city's low supplies and morale, and offered Najran generous terms of surrender. The Najrani populace, tired of the brutal fighting, accepted and opened the gates. However, it became immediately clear that King Nuaz's promise of peaceful surrender was a lie. Remember, he didn't just need to retake the city to prove himself, he had to retake it in a vengeful crusade to certify the authenticity of his conversion. Nuas's army took out its frustration from the prolonged siege on the people of Najran, with the Christian population being targeted with special malice. The king went out of his way to showcase the worst of the human capacity for cruelty on the local people. If you don't enjoy hearing about fairly graphic depictions of violence, I recommend you skip forward by about a minute. Upon seizing the city, Nuas immediately turned his attention to the leaders of Najran's Christian community. He ordered their arrest, and, once seized, he exhumed the body of the city's patron saint, and burned it in front of the captive priests, before beheading each and every one of them. Most infamously, when Nuas captured 400 of the city's nuns, he had them thrown into a ravine, breaking their legs. They were then soaked in oil, and burned alive. The burning of Christians at Najran is immortalized in the 85th Surah of the Quran, in which the so-called Men of the Ditch, referring to the Himyarite soldiers, are condemned for their cruel burning of innocent believers. Now, it is worth noting that the accounts of the most brutal persecutions come exclusively from sources sympathetic to the Christian cause, so it's definitely possible that the accounts of such violence are exaggerated. However, given the numerous, more reliable accounts of vast numbers of Najrani refugees fleeing into Aksumite and Roman cities, I think it's undeniable that atrocities of a horrifying scale were being carried out by Nuez's men in the city. So, why did Nuaz order these atrocities? Sure, we already talked about how he was facing pressure to prove the sincerity of his conversion, and that certainly played a part. I don't think that can wholly explain what happened in Najran, though. 
I mean, surely, just forcing the population to convert would have been more than enough to prove his authentic faith to the rabbis, right? Given the sheer extent of the cruelty that occurred at Najran, I think there had to be more than just that going on. I think it's worth mentioning that the groups which were targeted with the most fury were all groups that enjoyed close ties to Aksum. Nazrani soldiers drilled and trained with Aksumite armies, while many of the nuns and priests received their education in Aksumite monasteries. So, while he was clearly targeting Christians with these persecutions, it seems like some special attention was paid to hitting those with connections to Aksum the hardest. In my opinion, Nuas was not only trying to prove himself to the elites within his own kingdom, but was also actively and intentionally trying to provoke an Aksumite response. While seizing Najran had certainly helped improve the legitimacy of his position, the only true way for Nuas to unite the nobility and religious elite behind his rule was to fight a common enemy. Provoking a war with Aksum would also improve Himyar's standing with their Persian ally. Persia and Aksum had long been fierce rivals. Not only was Aksum an ally of Persia's main enemy, Rome, but Aksumite dominance of trade in the Indian Ocean threatened to wall out Persian economic interests. So, not only would war with Aksum unite his kingdom behind a common enemy, but it would bring him closer with his strongest ally. Optimistically, the Persians could even send him some supplies and military support, just to spite their Aksumite enemies. Well, if Nuas meant to provoke a war with Aksum, he certainly succeeded. Word of the invasion and persecution in Najran spread quickly. Caleb and the whole of Aksum were outraged at the brutality that had been displayed. It became immediately clear that war between the two kingdoms was inevitable. Nuas's persecution would have been more than enough to provoke a war with just about any Aksumite king, much less one as devoted to Christianity as Caleb. However, I don't want to leave you with the impression that the coming war with Himyar was entirely motivated by the persecution at Najran. It's worth reiterating that this was now Aksum's fifth war with Himyar, and that all the previous wars were not primarily motivated by religion, but by secular economic concerns. While these persecutions were certainly enough to provoke a response from a devout king like Caleb, convincing the rest of the Aksumite public to lend their full support to the war was another matter. Specifically, getting the merchants on board with the fight was of paramount importance. Najran, being in Arabia, is across the Red Sea from Aksum, which is in East Africa, of course. So, a big navy would be necessary to mount any sort of serious war against Himyar. And who else possessed a large fleet of boats but Aksum's merchants? Luckily for Caleb, these merchants needed no convincing. Himyar was Aksum's only major competitor in the international trade of incense. If Aksum could conquer Himyar, it would hold an international monopoly on frankincense and myrrh, and its merchants would profit immensely. Whether Caleb personally cared about these economic matters or not, these concerns of the merchants certainly contributed to the war fever that overcame Aksum. With the full cooperation of his kingdom's merchants, Caleb found himself in control of the largest navy in the Indian Ocean. Caleb also found support from his Roman ally. The Emperor Justin I had also caught wind of the tragedy in Najran. Seeking to aid his allies in their war, and to weaken an ally of the Persian rival, Justin pledged that a Roman fleet would arrive to help transport Aksum's armies to the lands of Himyar. The army which his fleet would carry was divided into two columns. The first army was led by Ariat, Caleb's younger brother. The second by a man named Abraha. Abraha is a man with mysterious origins. He likely came from somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa, as later Arabian accounts do not distinguish his appearance from other Aksumites, but a more specific point of origin is unclear. He first arrived in Aksum as the slave of a Roman merchant, who was promptly bought by a local, traded around, until he eventually ended up as a servant to the King Tazena. Much like the Bishop Frumentius, another royal slave who grew to prominence centuries ago, Abraha used his charismatic personality to win the admiration of the king, who eventually set him free and made him an important royal advisor. When Caleb rose to the throne, he cultivated an incredibly close relationship with Abraha. As the inexperienced and overwhelmed king tried to find his footing in politics, the veteran advisor proved to be a fantastic mentor in statesmanship. Much like Azana and Frumentius, this relationship of mentor and student quickly evolved into one of close friendship. The trust and affection between these two men culminated in Caleb's decision to appoint Abraha to a position of general. Positions of leadership in the Aksumite military were usually reserved exclusively for sons and brothers of the king. So, by appointing Abraha as general, Caleb was essentially saying that he viewed him as part of the family. 
With these two armies ready, the joint roman Oxumite fleet began ferrying the invading forces across the Red Sea. Arab sources claim that the combined force of the Oxumite invasion consisted of 170,000 men, though probably 70,000 is a more accurate estimate, equipped with thick quilted armor and steel weapons, and accompanied by an auxiliary force of Somali mercenaries. Even by the lowest estimates of the size of this army, Caleb's invasion force was the largest army that East Africa or the Arabian Peninsula had ever seen by a wide margin. In addition to their impressive numbers and armament, the Oxumites also ferried with them an impressive secret weapon, the War Elephant. These massive grey beasts were a terrifying sight to behold on the battlefield. The War Elephants of Oxum came from a species known as the African Bush Elephant, the largest variety of elephants on earth, with males measuring 13 feet high at the shoulder and weighing over 11 tons. The premium episode on Patreon will focus on these war elephants, so if you'd like to learn more about them, you can access this and other premium episodes by supporting the show on Patreon. Nuwas had been expecting an Oxumite invasion and had prepared for it for years, but even he was unready for what would arrive. Both the speed at which Caleb's army arrived on Himyar's shores, as well as its sheer magnitude, shocked Nuas. As the Oxumites landed in Arabia, Nuas's forces were immediately exposed as incapable of slowing their advance. Each of Caleb's armies began easily and rapidly pushing inland from the coast. To make matters worse for Nuas, the remaining Himyarite Christians joined with the invaders, further bolstering Oxum's numbers, as well as providing supplies and military aid. The Oxumite advance briefly stalled at the well-fortified city of Zafar, and Abraha's army was forced to make camp. The next day, each side's army once again lined up for battle. Nuas's strategy in this fight was a straightforward one. He would command his infantry to engage the Oxumite front line, and then send his cavalry around the preoccupied Oxumites to outflank them. However, Abraha had seen this attack coming. As the Himyarite cavalry dashed around the edges of the battlefield to flank Abraha's army, he ordered a counterattack from the war elephants he had been saving for this very moment. The elephants charged at the Himyarite cavalry, shaking the earth as they ran and sending the horses into a panic. With the cavalry out of position, it was now Abraha who could outflank his foe. As the war elephants and cavalry began to outflank and attack the overstretched Himyarite infantry, morale among Nuas's army dissolved, and the Himyarite line began to flee the battlefield. The Oxumite army pursued this disorderly retreat, and brutally harassed the fleeing Himyarites, and the competent and well-armed Himyarite army was reduced to a shadow of its former self. The Battle of Zafar was a disaster for the Himyarites, and would mark the end of any organized resistance to the Oxumite invasion. Nuas had gotten what he'd asked for. He had tried to provoke a war with Oxum, and most certainly succeeded, but while he sought to further unite his kingdom, he had instead destroyed it. In the year 525, Yosef Nuas rode his horse into the Red Sea, choosing to drown before he would see his kingdom fall. And, when Nuas breathed his last, so too did the kingdom of Himyar. A new Christian king, an Arab named Sumyafa Ashwa, was put to the throne. In reality, however, this new king was a thinly veiled puppet of Caleb. In terms of his actual responsibilities, Sumyafa ruled less like a king and more like a colonial governor. He paid frequent, harsh tributes to Caleb, and permitted a massive Oxumite garrison to permanently occupy his kingdom. For all intents and purposes, Himyar was now an Oxumite province. Caleb had avenged not only the martyrdom of the Christians of Najran, but had also avenged two centuries of Oxumite military defeat at the hands of Himyarites. Caleb's conquest of Yemen is often cited as the peak of Oxumite power. The army he assembled was the largest in Oxumite history, and would never be surpassed. In terms of foreign policy, Caleb crushed Oxum's most reviled rival, a thorn that had been wedged in Oxum's side for more than 200 years. He had spread the influence of his Christian faith, projected the power of Oxum abroad, and cultivated an even stronger relationship with his Roman ally. While it was overshadowed by his foreign policy, Caleb also oversaw a flourishing of Oxum's domestic economy. With the long-coveted monopoly on incense finally a reality, Oxumite merchants now commanded all the bargaining power when it came to the sale of incense and they profited immensely. The incoming profits from merchants also saw a revitalization of Oxumite art and architecture. Truly, in every sense, the early reign of Caleb was the most golden age for Oxum. It's often said that when someone hits rock bottom, there's nowhere to go but up. Unfortunately though, this is also true in the opposite sense. 
Once someone or something hits their peak, the only thing that can follow is an eternal plummet. While the first half of Caleb's reign was certainly the most successful any Oxmite king had ever experienced, the second half would be among its most disastrous. While the invasion of Yemen had certainly propelled Oxum into a golden age, the fragility of this conquest became apparent almost immediately. Within the Oxumite army, divisions are beginning to form on what they should do after the conquest. Now that their kingdom's longtime enemy was defeated, the two occupying Oxumite generals, Ariat and Abraha, began to develop two very different ideas of what should be done to Himyar. Abraha, who, remember, was a royal advisor first and a general second, saw things from the perspective of a statesman. The Himyarites were now in Oxumite territory and should thus be treated like Oxumite subjects. Yes, the Oxumites should encourage the adoption of Christianity, there was no question about that, but they should at least try to integrate the Himyarites into the Oxumite state first. He thought that instituting a puppet king was a mistake, and that Caleb should take charge of Himyar directly. Ariat disagreed. He believed that, since the Himyarites had started this war through religious persecution, it was only fair that they got a taste of their own medicine. Despite Abraha's objections, Ariat's army went on a rampage through the Himyarite countryside in an effort to repay the cruelty of Najran. Jewish or pagan towns were leveled, with their inhabitants either being slaughtered or coerced into conversion. Basically, Abraha wanted to subjugate the Himyarites, while Ariat wanted to punish them. The invasion of Himyar, while successful, had also been incredibly expensive in both lives and gold. With their greatest enemy and longtime rival vanquished, the Oxumites will now face a new enemy, the only one left who could challenge their uncontested might. These tensions between Ariat and Abraha will continue to escalate to a crisis. Join us for our next episode, when the military of Oxum turns on itself. The History of Africa podcast is brought to you by our Patreon supporters, like Aaron Lynch, Sandro, and Kevin Johnson. The show's editor and I put about 20 hours or more of work into each episode, so your support is crucial in helping us keep the lights on. Thank you so much for helping us make the show happen.